Next up on the Mutual Audio Network, fiction from our future. The following audio drama is rated PG-13, suggesting that children under the age of 13 should listen accompanied with an adult. Welcome back to the Carlson Chronicles. This episode is especially dedicated to Jim and Genova Osborne. In our last episode, Two Feathers brought Lars back through the scribe's passage. Everyone that Two Feathers encounters noticed a marked change in his demeanor. This puzzled Ian, Rachel, and Tad Johnson with the thoughts that the scribe's passage was dangerous. There was a huge battle between the Comanche and Freehold Three. There was only one casualty, Lawrence O'Leary, lost in the entire one-hour battle. Cassie chewed on Ian for his lackadaisical attitude towards the diversity of bringing the Comanche back into the world. So with that being said, let's get back to our story. The 13th of May, 4062, broke into a beautiful winter day. It was clear and cold, but I'll leave the rest of the weather for Steve Kirkson's radio show. Ian and company were heading back to the freehold. Rachel and Tad Johnson had negotiated a deal with the Comanche chief. The rest of his warriors wouldn't let him back out of making an agreement with the freehold. They would starve without their help. Balling Deer would only sign the agreement if the Robson's son was there to make sure nothing was amiss. He respected the Robson. His son had already gained the respect of the Comanche by standing a firewatch talk with Kessa and the foresters. The foresters he feared and distrusted. Falling Deer would wait for the Robson. You know, as young as Ian is, this is interesting that the Comanche see Ian in his father's place and title. As the narrator, you just can't help getting pulled into the storyline. Let me get back on track. Anyway, the Comanche chief and his warriors had glimpsed Ian through the silent trees at Jed Johnson Lake as he dug in the ground for soil samples. Only the presence of the Navajo, Two Feathers, kept them from approaching him for help. Rachel took in all that Falling Tree had said and was worried by what she'd heard. Falling Tree would only trust the one who commands the Elfin Ones to follow him. That, in their view, is Ian, or the Robson as they now called him. The Comanches weren't as backward as Kyle's notes had led me to believe. They are a trading culture today. They speak English and Spanish, but not their native tongue. Their braves are being educated at the Creek School in Muskogee. What had Ian done to gain their trust? Just then, the new doorbell Rachel had Claire Danson installed went off. Rachel went to the door. It was two feathers. I don't have time to explain. The look on your face tells me that I'm with Ian on our way here. I came through the scribe's passage from the Phoenix Freehold two years from now. Ian needs you to research the scribe passage and Ephraim Cohen before he goes to Anadarko. He needs to know where the Law Tones, First Silapache, came from, and any time paradox must not be seated in his mind. I can't say more. I have to leave before I'm seen. Are you real? Am I having a waking dream? No, all will be explained in time. I'm here in the time twice and can't run into myself. To do so would lead to another time paradox. Rachel opened the door in a confused, unbelieving daze, while Two Feathers slipped out and was gone. She never got back to her workstation before the doorbell went off again. She sighed and went to answer it. Opening the door, Rachel says, Tad, what are you doing here? These notebooks are my notes on the Comanche and the Fort Sill Apache over the past 15 years. I hope they're useful. Gives them to Ian before he goes to Anadarko. It might help. Kyle had asked me to compile all I can find in the correspondence libraries about the Comanche. He said I'd know what to do with them when the time came. Kyle was always saying stuff like that. Stuff never made any sense at the time. He was a scribe and it was like a compulsion to do what he asked. That's two today. People are giving me messages about the Comanche and law times. I guess I'd better get busy. Ian should already be here. I wonder what the holdup is. Who knows? I have to leave too. My escort is waiting on me to tie up my loose ends and get my walking shoes on. 
If you have a question or need something of me, I'll be at the other end of a radio call. Don't hesitate to call. I won't hesitate. By the way, who is the interim supervisory elder? It will be Clarkson. The official notice hasn't been issued yet. Be, be careful out there, Tad. I guess I'll see you when you come back this way. Rachel closed the door after the second strange conversation of the day, and it is only 0900 hours. She went directly to her console. Now she wanted to know where the law tones or the Apache came from. My head would be spinning about now. I'm glad it's her and not me trying to puzzle this one out. I'd almost be afraid to do the research. We're going to take a short sponsor break. We'll be right back. Imagine the world around you is nothing but an illusion. Creatures of legend wage endless wars between shadow and light, but you never see it. Even now, dark forces threaten reality as we know it, but most people never know they exist. This is the world I walk in. I am called Byron, and these are my chronicles. The Byron Chronicles, available at ericbosbypresents.com, iTunes, Stitcher, and everywhere else podcasts are available. And now back to our story. Kita pulled the half-track smoothly through the doors of the freehold garage. This had been a strange trip. Two feathers had slept the whole drive. Granted, the mud had made a 40-minute trip take an hour and a half. Don and Roy had talked until after midnight about the need to create natural stone roads rather than use the buffalo trails to drive from place to place. Kita had been fascinated because their discussion had discarded the asphalt or concrete the ancients had used for roads. Crusher run of rock in algae-based plastic had been their final solution. It just seemed to her that they couldn't leave nature alone. They wanted to fix everything. She had to admit that a smooth passage would be welcome after she had driven through mud and slick rocks to get the five miles from Jed Johnson Lake to the freehold. Okay, everybody out. We're here. Two feathers, wake up. Didn't you sleep last night? No, Lars talked all night. It was that five in a row game with the colored stones. The two feathers beat me 14 times running. I had to win at least one. You could have let me win at least one. Why? When you do win, you'll have earned it. I'm not just going to give the game to you. How would you learn from defeat? if you weren't defeated. The point is, I might want to play it again. If I won, at least once. We've got to get up to Mom's and be brief before we can meet with Falling Deer. Dad's notes say to always take Two Feathers with me when I meet with the Law Tones or Comanche. Do you know why Two Feathers? I do, but I'm not liberty to tell you what your father left out of the notes. It's my secret. <laughs> How juvenile. Lars, there's a secret to the game. You have to pay attention to the level on which it is set before the electronic board is loaded with stones. Two Feathers had it set for level 40. To learn, you want to start at level 1. You never stood a chance. Well, I never. Two Feathers, how could you do such an underhanded thing to me? The result would have been the same at any level against a novice player. You'll thank me for making you think harder. Someday. They had reached Rachel's door. Ian noticed the door knocker was now missing. He laughed as he pressed the button in its place. I'm going to miss watching Rachel and whoever else is in this house scramble to catch the wall hangings before they hit the floor when the door knocker was used. It's about time you got here. I was beginning to worry. I drove. You only have to worry if Ian drives. Carrie, would you take our things up to Ian's apartments, please? I will. I'll call for one of those electric carts to take me up. Carrie went back out the door to wait on their ride. Lunch would be started for the others once Carrie got to Ian's quarters. 
Carrie was becoming quite the cook. Maybe we should start a web streaming show about freehold fine dining. Carrie could host. You know, that sounds like a good idea. I wonder how I can go about getting that podcast started. Hmm. Do we have time for coffee before you go see Falling Deer? We should. I see him after lunch. I need to know what all is in the agreements before I go down to the infirmary. Has Mr. Johnson left yet? You're stuck with me. Tad headed out with an es- with an escort Kessa sent. The agreement is simple. We promise to help feed the Comanches through the winter, to provide seeds and to replace the molded seeds, and to intercede for them in the clan house in Anadarko. I did some research this morning. First, we have to stop calling them the Law Times. They are the descendants of the Fort Seal Apache. Second, they were brought here in Corn's time to assist and nurture his plantings. And third, they were not bioengineered. Corn used the scribe's passage and retrieved them. Where did Corn retrieve them from? Corn did record where he got them from. All his or his son's notes make it clear. Time paradoxes must be avoided, or the traveler will suffer overlapping time and conflicting memories. Bringing the Fort Seal Apache forward evidently added to the eccentric behavior Corn exhibited later in life. Alright, good to know. But how does that help? There's nothing magic in that agreement. Why does Falling Deer want me there for the treaty ratification? I really don't know, Ian. That mystifies me as well. Tad left his research on the Comanche and the Law Tomes for you. Wait a minute. The Fort Seal Apache... (laughs) I've got to get used to saying that. When we asked Falling Deer, he said that you commanded the elven ones and the Comanches would make agreements only with you. Ian, before you talk to Falling Deer, scan the notes Ambassador Johnson left you. The book of Mr. Johnson's will take days to get through. I don't have that kind of time. I'll scan the first of it for sure. I hope there are answers in them. You'll have time before we reach Anadarko to read most of it. The two feathers can drive with Keita and Carrie. So, you're prepared to intercede for them with the clan house assembly? It also makes it wise to stay here for two days. Time is what is needed to digest, as much information as you can. Ian, you can't stand before the clan unprepared. They are educated men and women. You must use the past to secure a future for the Comanche, and more correctly, the Fort Sill Apache. Your father knew all this. But it wasn't time to push the issue of reunification before he died. I thought the Comanche were brought back by the San Antonio Freeholds programs. What reason could bring all the tribes in Anadarko to take on the reclamation tasks, especially for these two Indian sects? Because they must, Ian. Look, I don't know what's down there on level 9 in those labs, but it clearly ties us to the rebirthing of the tribes. As I've already told you, it's not time. Yet the circumstances are spelled out in Rachel Cohan's journals for activating those labs. If I have read the indicator gauges right, there are years of antimatter left in the containers for level 9. Ian's right, Rachel. Kyle briefed me as well. Those labs could destroy the fragile peace we enjoy today. As a scribe, Rachel, you of all people should know this. Even when they are put back into use, it will have to be kept a secret. Three Freeholds rioted and died because of what was in that lab. Remember that briefing experience human Two Feathers had when Ian unearthed the information on once human origins? Well, that was just the tip of an iceberg, and personally, I don't want to go through a repeat of history again. Thank you very much. Well, I see clearly that you two know more than you're telling. I'll take the hint to keeping my nose out of it and my mouth shut. Our trip to Portland reinforces the need for caution. The Iron Dead were not in evidence, but the biological weapon they had unleashed was still potent. 
Well, you definitely lost me there. I recorded exactly what Two Feathers told me of the event. I still haven't had time to research what I recorded. The Pell Man known as Bryron belongs to his own universe and even more to his own realm. Two Feathers' actions were responsible given the circumstances. His curse is to remember the cost of his choices. We have to learn from those actions. Okay, okay, I give in, uncle. Take Tad's research and do what's necessary. Besides, I've got work to do. Rorick and Bobby April are due to call in here in 20 minutes, and I've got prep of my own. Man, they clipped her wings back a bunch. Wow, Rachel handled that better than I would have. Okay, where was I? Hmm. Oh yeah, Ian's group left for his apartments. They were looking forward to being in the freehold for a couple of days. Rachel, on the other hand, was going to be busy. She had to find a way to get 200 solar panels to the Black Sea, or BS, freehold without crossing the Atlantic. Okay, maybe that's an impossible task. We'll have to wait and see. You've been listening to the Carlson Chronicles. We will return in two weeks with another episode. The Carlson Chronicles was written by J.A. Babian, narrated by Charlie Weirach III, and starred Tom Cat, Mark Poland, Ellie Hirschman, Tim Evans, Julie Moles, Tracy Babian, Malcolm Clays, Daniel Abaday, Josh Patillo, Mikey Henderson, Echo Uncles Bay, W. Bruce Jaworski, Krista Huffaker, Ryan Birch, James Roberson, and Sarah Patterson. Produced by PurviewProjects.com. Casting and art design by Tracy Badian. Sound design by J.A. Badian. Carlson theme song by Sven Newprons, used with his permission. Background music by David Fesselian Studios, and used with his permission. Special thanks to the Comanche Nation and their archives at www.comanchenation.com, also known as Lords of the Plains, and the Comanche Museum and Cultural Center, located in Lawton, Oklahoma. For more info about the show, visit www.carlsonchronicles.simdiff.com. Special thanks to Eric Busby Presents.com for the use of the names Byron, The Pale Man, The Iron Dead, used in tandem with the crossover episodes of the award-winning The Byron Chronicles, Beyond the Veil, featuring David Alt as Byron. Hi, my name is Tracy Babian, co-author of the Carlson Chronicles podcast. My husband, J.A. Babian, the main author, had a triple stroke in the latter part of August of this year. Jerry was lifelighted to Tulsa, Oklahoma, with a brain bleed that the doctors thought they were going to have to do surgery on him, which surely would have killed him. Thank the Lord they didn't. He survived that brain bleed and swelling, but he is in need of so much for his recovery I have started a GoFundMe to help with all the costs that I just don't have. I retired back in April of this year so that I could take care of Jerry, as he was starting to show signs then that I just didn't catch. Little did I know this would be a blessing in disguise. He is fighting this setback of memory loss and 75% use of his right leg, arm, along with his cognitive speech. Considering the doctor said he would not make it, I consider him to be a miracle. Medicare has only granted 12 visits of physical and speech therapy twice a week. He needs at least six months worth of speech therapy alone. That is a total of $4,000 we need to pay up front that I just don't have. So far, we have had $775 in donations of the 10000 we need come in. Please donate today so that he can get his needed medication, therapy, and also help pay bills that Medicare just will not cover, even if it's only $5. I update this account so folks can see his progress. You can go to my Facebook account, Tracy Babian VO, to find the pinned link with the title Jerry Babian Stroke Victim Needs. Jerry says, thank you. I still have a lot to write on my stories that I want to get done. Please help me to achieve that goal. Thank you in advance for your donation. Tracy Babian.